Hi, so I'm going to go through the second part of the vicarious liability summary that we started. So just as a quick reminder, what we've done is we've talked about vicarious liability and the mechanism behind it and the reasons for it. We've started talking about the three stage tests that the claimant must prove if they want to sue the employer rather than the employee. So we must establish that they are an employee and that they actually committed a tort. Now remember, you don't actually go through that. You simply state that they may have potentially committed negligence, nuisance, violence, etc. Step three is really, really important if you want to get high levels for your application. Was the tort committed that we talked about in step two? Within the course of employment. Now this is a really, really important phrase and one that students often struggle with. You can't just sue an employer for what a person does because they happen to be their employer. So for example, if a Starbucks worker is out on a Saturday night in a nightclub and punches somebody, that doesn't automatically mean Starbucks is responsible simply because they work there. The tort has to be connected to them carrying out their job. It has to be within the course of employment. So you need to have a clear grasp on what that means. An academic called Salmond wrote a, book, a book called Salmond on Torts. And he said that there were two situations he thought actions will be in the course of employment. And the judges have adopted this and used it. So to decide this, we use what is referred to as the salmon test. Now it has a D on the end, it's not a fish. So the salmon test helps us decide. And Mr. Salmon thought there were two things that would fall into the course of employment that an employee might do. The first is an authorised wrongful act. Or it might be an authorised act done in a wrongful way. Well, you might be looking at that and thinking, well, what's the difference really? And there are some key similarities. So the key similarities between the two is that the employee is doing an authorised act. By that, we mean part of their job. And what we mean there, of course, is a job that's included in the course of their employment. I like to think of it as if you were to imagine your job description, what would be involved? So for example, what would the job of a teacher involve? What would the job of a retail worker involve? What would the job of a doctor involve? So for both A and B, it has to be something that's part of their job. The key distinction between these two is who determines that it will be done wrongfully. An authorised wrongful act is where the employer asks you or decides that you're going to commit a wrong. Whereas for B, this is the employee deciding to do it in a wrongful way. Let me give you a silly example. You're employed as a pizza delivery driver and the shop has a policy that if it's not delivered within 30 minutes, the customer gets it for free. Your boss tells you he doesn't want to give anyone free pizzas, so he tells you that you need to break the speed uh, limit to deliver this pizza. So when he tells you to break the speed limit, he's telling you to do your job, an authorised act, delivering pizzas, but he has decided you are doing it in a wrongful way. He's authorised 
you're doing that wrongful act. So therefore it's very, very clear, and I think very, very fair, that the employer should be responsible if you hit somebody, for example, when you're speeding. I think A is really fair, because in reality, if our boss tells us to do something, it can be hard to say no, because we think it might lead to us losing our job. So the law recognises that we don't always have a lot of choice when it comes to following instructions from our bosses. B is more controversial, because this is where the employer is doing their job. Sorry, the employee is doing their job, but they decide to do it in a wrongful way. So, for example, I say to my employee, this is the last pizza for you to deliver. When you're done, you can go home, you're finished for the night. That employee is really keen for an early finish, so they speed along and they hit somebody. The employer is still going to be responsible for that because the delivery driver was doing an authorised act, driving, delivering pizzas. They've done it in a wrongful way, but that's included. I didn't tell them to speed. The employee decided to do that themselves, but the employer still takes responsibility. So this one is more controversial. It is really straightforward. So in the case of Poland versus Parr, for example, the boss told the employee to protect the goods however necessary. It was therefore implied that they were authorised to do wrongful acts to protect the goods, like attack potential thieves. B needs more examination. So things where we've seen examples of acts being done in a wrongful way is where they've been done negligently. So, for example, in the case of Century, um, Century Insurance, the employee was smoking a cigarette and he negligently, carelessly threw the cigarette down while he was waiting in the petrol station. Now, that came under B because he was doing an authorised act, waiting for the petrol to be unloaded, but he decided to do it a wrongful way, which was smoking while doing it. So, that was something the employer was liable for. It can also be against specific instructions, even more controversial. So in the case of Limpus versus London Omnibus, the bus drivers were told do not race with each other. The bus drivers ignored the instructions and raced each other, they hit somebody and the employer was liable because the bus drivers were doing an authorised act, which was driving the bus, in a wrongful way speeding even though it was against instructions now remember this is because the employer is in control and they should be in, uh, controlling their employees better there wasn't a claim in beard versus london omnibus though because the bus conductor whose job is normally to check tickets decided to drive the bus now this was not an authorized act because it's not part of a ticket collector's job to drive the bus Clearly it was wrongful. Now in that case, we call this a frolic of their own. An employer is not liable for frolics of their own. You need to sue the employee directly as you normally would. So they were able to sue the bus conductor as an individual, but they weren't able to sue the bus company. We also saw this in the case of Rose versus Plenty, where the um, Dairy had said that milkmen couldn't use uh, young kids to help them with their milk rounds. The milkman ignored these instructions, paid a kid to help, and the kid fell off the milk float and injured himself. This was an authorised act because he was driving, delivering milk, done in a wrongful way because he'd ignored the instructions and had driven dangerously. The court said the employer was still responsible. Now, those are some examples where you can see that Maybe it's, it, it's fair, not fair, argue both ways. And there are plenty of more examples in your handouts and online and textbooks that you can search. What I want to kind of look at now is the idea sometimes that we go one step further. What we've seen here is people acting carelessly. So in Century Insurance, throwing the cigarette down, he didn't mean any harm. He was just acting in a careless way. But what if... What if it's what we call an intentional tort? Intentional torts are also referred to 
as crimes. What if it wasn't a mistake? What if it's something that the employee done willingly? And unfortunately, we've seen a number of cases that have involved historical sex abuse, where the victims have then wanted to sue the employer, often because the actual employee, the top visa, is in prison for what they've done. We saw this in the case of Lister versus Hesley Hall. And in that case, a warden at a boys boarding school was in charge of the boys welfare and he used his position of influence and power to befriend the boys, get to know them and then eventually sexually abuse them. The victims wanted to sue the school for employing him and this leads a much more difficult question because how can we say that what he was doing is an authorised act done wrong? How can we say that the courts then used a case from Canada as persuasive precedent and came up with a new test. So if it's an intentional tort, we use the Lister Close Connection Test. Now sometimes you'll hear it just called the Close Connection Test, sometimes you'll hear it just the Lister Test, it's the same thing. Now the Lister Test asks a further question to help us determine Part B, I'll repeat this in a second. So list the close connection test asks, was the tort so closely connected to the job role that it would be fair just and reasonable to hold the defendant liable. Now this is a much broader question and gives much more discretion to the judges to make what they think is a fair, just and reasonable decision. We're no longer just asking if it was part of the job. We're asking if the two, the job role and the tort, are so closely entwined, we think it's fair that the employer takes responsibility. Now, in the Lister case, they decided yes. The sexual abuse was so closely connected to his role as the warden because he used that influence to get the boys to like him that it would be fair, just and reasonable for them to hold them liable. Now, the judges said in Orbit Edicta, in other discussion, they gave an example of a gardener. A gardener would fail this test. Sexually abusing students would not be closely connected to the job role of a gardener. It may give them access to the property, but you certainly couldn't say it's closely connected to the job role of a gardener. We've seen this in other cases going forward. We've used the list of close connection test. So what we are doing is we are trying to decide, part B, was it an authorised act done in a wrongful way? Well, if the tort is so closely connected that it would be fair, just and reasonable, the answer is yes. It's not a frolic of their own, and therefore we can sue the employer. We've had a spate of recent cases about this, and there are just two, there are others in your handout, but there are two that I would just like to draw your attention to. So the first, is Mohammed versus Morrison's, a very key recent case where it was in the course of employment. So in this case, a member of staff racially abused a customer at petrol station. He told her to get out of the petrol station and then attacked him as he was leaving. So if we think of the whole test, the petrol station attendant was clearly an employee of Morrison's. The potential tort committed was actually battery, which is also a tort. And then we have to decide whether that attack was within the course of his employment as a petrol station attendant. Was it A, an authorised wrongful act? Clearly not. 
Morrison's did not expressly or impliedly say they can attack customers. So the only way we can sue Morrison's is if B is satisfied. Was the attack an authorised act done in a wrongful way? Now this wasn't a kind of negligent mistake against instructions. This was intentionally done. This was a crime. So we asked the list of close connection test. Was the attack so closely connected to his job role as a petrol station attendant that it would be fair, just and reasonable to hold Morrison's liable? And in that case, they said, yes, it would be. Now, the reason for that is because his job is interacting with customers and that's what he was doing. He was telling him to get off the premises. Now, if you don't quite understand or agree with this decision, you're not the only one. The Court of Appeal decided the other way and the Supreme Court reversed that decision on appeal. So even the judges can't quite agree, but obviously the Supreme Court has decided it was closely connected, so that's the decision that stands. To give an example of a case that was not closely connected is N versus the Chief Constable of Merseyside Police. This was a terrible case which involved a, a young woman, very drunk and vulnerable, being taken home by an off-duty police officer and sexually attacked over several hours. The police officer was fired and went to prison and the victim tried to sue the police force in vicarious liability. The tortfeasor, the attacker, was a police officer that was clearly employed by Merseyside Police. Again, he'd committed a tort, which is battery. If you remember the definition of battery, it is the unlawful touching of another, which of course that would be. The key question was whether the sexual abuse was committed within the course of the police officer's employment. Was it part of his job? It's obviously not an authorised wrongful act. Merseyside police would never have authorised their staff to act that way. So the only way the victim could sue is if she could prove it was an authorised act done in a wrongful way. Now, it wasn't just a negligent issue or ignoring instructions. This was something the officer did intentionally as a crime. So the court asked the list of close connection test. Was the sexual abuse so closely connected to his job role as a police officer that it would be fair, just and reasonable to hold the police liable? And surprisingly, the Court of Appeal said it was not. Now, we've learned from cases like Hill versus the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire Police that police are protected. They owe us a duty of care as a society, but not to us as individuals. It's not their job to safeguard our individual safety. So in that case, where she was put into the car to be driven to the police station, that is not normally his job. Now this may seem like a stretch, and to be honest, it's probably more guided by policy and the idea of whether it would be fair, just and reasonable to safeguard every drunk, vulnerable person out there, which would obviously be a very difficult thing to do. So you need to be aware that the Lister question then answers part B for us when there are crimes. So that police officer was on a frolic of his own when he committed that sexual attack and therefore the victim has only the option of suing him, not the employer. That's everything that you need to cover for vicarious liability. You can also use the handout to get extra cases to give even more examples. This is a very memorable area and one that changes all the time. So keep an eye out, keep an ear out for more cases that happen. Thanks.